Pavel has had a defining influence on my life and I shall forever be grateful. But I think, and, and there are a number in that situation in the group here, but I think it's fair to say, moreover, that to different degrees, we have all been impacted by him. For instance, uh, this seminar series might not exist without his coming to Montreal. And so we, I feel, are all indebted to him and have hence a duty of memory. May I just say, I want to be brief, but for the younger among us, you should know that in the aftermath of the Prague Spring, Pavel brought to Montreal the great Soviet tradition of Falk and Landau in theoretical physics. He brought that here. And through the inspiration, together with uh, Patera, their inspiration, their hard work, their openness, their contacts, and their organizational activities. Pavel, as I said, together, together with Irji, they have put Montreal on the map and established the Montreal School. Science, and in fact, life, is about taking the relay from the people we meet, we love, and those who shape who we are. So we owe it to Pavel to make sure the tradition he has established endures. And this is to us now. In closing, I should say to our speaker, who most likely will not have known Pavel, but uh, he would certainly have much enjoy meeting you because he was a polyglot. And uh, he would have enjoyed to converse with you in uh, your mother tongue that he spoke fluently because his mother was uh, German. So in memory of Pavel, let's move on. Merci Luc for this uh, touching speech. It's indeed weird to uh, continue the seminar series without Pavel in the room. He was always uh, there even though he was, you know, 84, very impressive uh, person. But as you said, you know, Pavel would have liked us to uh, continue the tradition and uh, that's what we shall do today. And, uh, you know, it's an honor today to, for me to introduce one of my colleagues and uh, collaborators and friends, uh, Michael Knapp, who's a professor at the Technical University of Munich in Germany. Um, Michael is Austrian. He did his uh, physics degree at uh, Graz University. And afterwards, this was his PhD, after he moved to Harvard uh, as a postdoc. And that's where I met him. I gave a seminar there and we started a collaboration that led to a, a cool paper. Um, and after his postdoc, he was immediately recruited uh, in Munich and he's been there since. And uh, in 2015, he was awarded uh, the Rudolf Mosbauer Tenure Track Assistant Professorship. Uh, Michael has made many important contributions um, in the field of many body localization, uh, dynamical aspects, non equilibrium aspects of quantum many body systems, um, and various others. He's a very well-cited scientist. And today he'll talk about a topic uh, which he's uh, spearheading, uh, which is about Hilbert space fragmentation and that has connections to integrability um, and other such topics. So uh, Michael, I'm gonna let you take the mic. And I muted you, so yeah. I don't hear you. Okay, good. Yeah, thanks, Will, for the very kind introduction. It's really a great honor uh, for me uh, to give this seminar uh, here today, which is, as I hear, a very special seminar for you too, right? Uh, so uh, I hope I can somewhat <laughs> fulfill your, your expectations and deliver a, some, a somewhat interesting and exciting uh, yeah, perspective on the Silver Space Fragmentation 
which I'm going to present, uh, talk about today. So, um, yeah, we, Will did not say so, but I mean, I'm uh, not at all a rigorous physicist, mathematical physicist or, uh, or, 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 or coming from that area, but more uh, kind of metaphysics inspired, and therefore a lot of the presentation will not be very rigorous, right? But, but I still hope that I con can convey the main physical ideas uh, of this project. And I also would like to ask you to interrupt me at any time in case I'm not very clear in how I present or qualitatively argue about my, uh, my, my reasonings. So then- Could I just well, say uh, something about the uh, acoustics? I don't know if everyone else hears it, but there seems to be a tunnel effect. Let me, let me, this may be because at home, this room is very empty. Just me in here. <laughs> so let me let me try to switch on um, my earphones. Maybe this is working. Let's see. This so I think you should be able to hear me now. Is this right? Yes, it's much better. It's much better. Okay, good. And let's let's uh, speak to this. And it may look a little bit more funny, but <laughs> at least fine. Okay, so um, what I want to say is that actually uh, the, the project which I'm talking on today uh, about. No, is sorry, I'm sorry to I'm sorry to interrupt again, but now there's some kind of static that has just come. Before it was a kind of tunnel echo. I don't know if others are hearing it. Yeah, so John, actually, um, you know, on my side, the, the sound was fine before. I mean, yeah, the I echo was it. not leading to any problems. I think it's right. worse. Well. Either way. It's worth now? Okay, then let's worth uh, now. Yeah. yeah, I would go back to the original mode. Thanks. Okay, back to normal speakers. So let's see. Does this work? Okay, good. So then let's just yes, carry yes. on with that and I hope that that, that you can understand me well. So the project about Hilbert space fragmentation has been mainly pushed forward by our PhD students, uh, Pablo and Tibor, also with input by Giuseppe, Ruben, and Johannes from our group. And a lot of the ideas have been developed together with uh, Frank Borman, um, who is also professor in the Constant Theory group in Munich. So a generic, uh, a generic question, in the field of uh, non-equilibrium dynamics of strongly interacting many body system is about the quantum thermalization processes which are taking place in the system. So we do know that the time evolution of a quantum mechanical system is unitary. So when we start with a pure state, it will remain so in the due course of the time evolution. So the question is, how can you think about a closed quantum many body system to thermalize? And um, the idea which we are adopting is the following. So when we start out with an isolated quantum system, maybe you can think about this as particles being occupied in a certain site. So this is a Fox state, uh, if you want. And you can think of the blue dots as either being spin up and the white dots as being spin down, or the blue dot is a particle and the white dot is not a particle. Uh, so what I want to uh, illustrate here with these graphics is that we are starting out with a product state, a state which doesn't carry any quantum entanglement. And when we are now time evolving this state, it will remain pure uh, so, uh, at, at all times, but quantum correlations are forming by the application of the time evolution operator, right? So the system starts to entangle and yeah, new kind of superpositions of uh, operators are essentially formed uh, in the time of, or superpositions of states are formed in the time evolution of the system. And in the end, uh, what, how we can think about, let's say, the properties of the subsystem is that when we, oh, sorry, when we cut out, let's say, a part of our big quantum anybody system, then we might think of this subsystem as looking as if it's, as if it's terminal, right? So that's the idea how we can think about quantum thermalization in an isolated in an isolated many body system. So while the whole state remains pure, a subsystem may look as if it was terminal because of this generation of uh, quantum correlations due to the time evolution operator. So this uh, can be formalized also a little bit, um, I mean, more concretely 
uh, and less graphically if you want. So when we're thinking about the expectation value of few body observables. So the idea is we start with an initial state, which is not an eigen state of our system. We time evolve it in, uh, we time evolve it with our unitary time evolution operator. Then, uh, of course, my observable, the expectation value becomes time dependent. But I can introduce a time averaged version of this operator, right? So I average over times up to a certain time t and divide by time to get rid of some oscillations, which are mainly due to finite size effects, if you want. And then I can ask, in the spirit of what I have uh, shown to you pictorially before, then I can ask whether the um, uh, whether this time averaged expectation value is equal to a statistical um, expectation value with a density matrix given by microcanonical uh, uh, in, given in a microcanonical form. So the energy is fixed essentially by the initial product state which we are choosing. We can just evaluate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian with respect to this initial product state, and then we can look at uh, a microcanonical uh, density matrix um, uh, which would correspond uh, to this energy essentially, and ask is this long time average of the time evolved observable the same uh, as this uh, as this term expectation value, if you want. And if this picture, which I was advocating to you before, that the subsystem can be effectively described by a thermal state, if this holds true, then the left hand side and the right hand side of this equation, they should coincide. And numerically, this has been investigated well more than 10 years ago now uh, in a lot of detail by Marcos Rigol. So he has done some exact numerical studies on the time evolution of a quantum system. And he could demonstrate essentially that the time evolution of this time average quantity indeed relaxes uh, to this uh, microcanonical expectation value. Okay. So this is uh, essentially what brings me to the so-called eigenstate hypothesis. So the idea is maybe a lot of formulas for that, what I want to say, but a many-body state can be written as a superposition of Fox states. So N would be some Fox states. And then uh, essentially the, the late time expectation value of my observable would actually be given just by the expectation value of the operator in these Fox states. This is because uh, we assume that in general systems, there are no degeneracies. And so the time evolutions will give rise to rapidly evolving, you know, this time evolution here of the state will give rise to rapidly evolving phases unless the contribution of the phase to the right and the contribution of the phase to the left uh, of this expectation value are the same, right? This is essentially what this uh, what this um, yeah, expectation value tells us, and that's the so-called diagonal, diagonal ensemble. Yeah? Okay. So if now ETH says that if now this expectation value is a smooth function of energy in the thermodynamic limit, and the off-diagonal elements between different Fox states are small, uh, then essentially uh, um, a system is thermalizing. Then this is true that essentially the late time average of the observable is the same as the expectation value of the, of the uh, microcanonical uh, density matrix. This has been put forward by Deutsch and Srednitsky uh, now yeah, 30 years ago. And okay, so in that notion, we can say that, okay, we, we can have a system is thermalizing if it fulfills the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So as you can see, this is all not very rigorous because we can't prove uh, this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis and there may be exceptions, but at least it gives us some guiding principles of how we can think about uh, thermalization in disclosed quantum many body systems. And if now for all eigenstates of the systems, uh, this condition is fulfilled, then we are speaking about strong ETH and weak ETH, maybe that they are, that this condition is fulfilled for almost all states, right? So the exceptions can exist, but they are vanishingly rare in the exponentially small uh, Hilbert space. If we have strong ETH uh, present, then it ensures thermalization for any initial state, okay? So why am I bringing this up? Because in, generally, in general, people were thinking 
that when we are considering and interacting and um, uh, an interacting generic many body system, that it should be ob obeying this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. It should be fully ergodic and density matrices should be only defined by a few uh, conserved quantities. For instance, if the total charge or the total magnetization of a, of a system is conserved, this will be added as a Lagrange multiplier, as a Lagrange multiplier to the, uh, to the, to the partition sum. And all eigenstates look thermal. This is the conventional wisdom and observables who relax to their thermal expectation values, right? So this is was, well, for long times, uh, the wisdom that this is true for generic, for generic quantum many body systems. But then recently, people have also been thinking about a different set of systems, which are strongly interacting, but also strongly disordered systems. And those uh, systems can undergo a phase transition to a so-called many-body localized phase of matter. In this phase of matter, all these um, ETH predictions completely fail. And we, we say it's a non ergodic phase of matter. Eigenstates are not thermal, and, uh, and, and we have extensively many integrals of motions which are emerging out of the system. So it's not like in an integrable system where, you know, where I have uh, due to beta answer solution extensively many uh, local integrals of motion. So here they, they pop up really as an emergent quantity, okay? So, and the question is somehow, you know, we have this rich behavior. These, these two cases have been studied in our field intensely over the last decades. On the one hand, these ergodic states, and on the other hand, the many body localized states. And we wanted to ask a bit, I mean, is this all to the story? Is there really this dichotomy of dynamical yeah, universality classes of quantum many body systems, or can there be also intermediate behavior? Okay. So, in some sense, I mean, so I, since I'm not sure about all the background uh, um, uh, of, 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 of you, so I'm, it may be very overwhelming somehow what I uh, was presenting to you. Uh, here, but I hope that it somehow that this classification um, uh, make makes sense for the what I'm presenting to you. Other questions at this point? Okay. Yeah, I might have a question. Yes. Do you please. have an example? What, what kind of material are. Uh, uh, ah, okay. So, so here at the moment, I'm still thinking on a very conceptual uh, level. So, and, and if, you want, if you want, I'm thinking on the level of Hamiltonians and their properties. Like, for instance, later on in this talk, we will think about uh, quantum magnets, about spin system, which are strongly interacting uh, and which should naively fall into these fully ergodic side of the system. And then how these questions can be tested experimentally. I mean, this is most convincingly done since we are really interested in the real time evolution of the system. This is most convincingly done in synthetic quantum systems, which means that one can set up, for instance, a uh, quantum computer with superconducting qubits. So this is, for instance, this example here shown on the right hand side, where we had a collaboration with the Google team and their quantum computer to look at these non ergodic states uh, of matter, the many body localized ones. Or you can, for instance, uh, study in a systematic way ultra cold atoms in an optical lattice where you can also realize uh, to a perfect degree the Hamiltonians which we are thinking about and then also study subsequently the time evolution, for instance, from an initial product state. So this is the big advantage of the synthetic quantum systems that you can deterministically prepare with very high fidelities individual product states, for instance, and then look at the subsequent time evolution. So this is more the, the, the setting which we have in mind. It's, it's less in the material context um, uh, here because, uh, because we are really interested in, in, in time evolution properties and in closed system properties, right? In a, in a solid, uh, I would rather have to think about phonons. I would have to think about uh, where can I deposit energy and it becomes much, much, much more complicated, but also very interesting. Uh, but this is more, I mean, here I really want to think 
uh, in theory land, which can be then realized maybe in the synthetic quantum systems. Does this answer the question? Ah, yeah, okay, you brought it in the chat. Okay, so perfect. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So this brings me now to the outline. So as I said, I want to ask the question, can there be intermediate behavior uh, to this dichotomy of, let's say, ergodic dynamics and, 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 and many body localization? So, and what we have found in a set of systems is that actually a very interesting phenomenon can happen, which is very unconventional. So what can happen in a system which conserves in addition to the total charge or magnetization of a spin chain, when you're also conserving the dipole moment of the system, okay? Then in such a case, there can the Hilbert space is chopped up in exponentially many sectors and these uh, sectors are disconnected. So they are not connected by the Hamiltonian. And this is a very uh, interesting property. And this also is motivated actually from, from, experimental, um, from, from, from an experimental background, um, this diaper conservation. So it's not very, I mean, it's, it's not a talk why we studied this. It's essentially a consequence of a, yeah, of a, of a synergy of different fields. So on the one hand, um, uh, diaper conservation is a defining property of fractonic quantum matter. So fractonic quantum systems is a new uh, kind of exotic phase of matter, which is not yet fully understood. And people work hard to understand it at the moment. It kind of combines uh, knowledge from quantum information, from uh, condensed matter and, um, and, 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 uh, and so on. And, um, and also topology of, of, of phases of matter. And um, I mean, one defining principles of the fractonic systems is the diaper conservation. This was how we actually entered in that field. But also, for instance, when you're thinking about fraction, fractional uh, quantum Hall states in the thin a torus limit, they have Hamiltonians like those which I'm going to discuss. Anyway, I mean, it's maybe not so uh, important, but there's also a big physics background here, why we are interested in this type of conserving Hamiltonians. And as I said, I mean, I will first of all uh, discuss with you uh, this exp exponent exponential fragmentation of the Hilbert space. And then also I want to uh, kind of tell you how we can label these individual sectors. So there are new emergent conserved quantities, which we call statistically localized integrals of motion. The name where it's coming from will be hopefully clear later in this talk. And I will, uh, yeah, and this will essentially uh, tell you, uh, allows you to label these individual sectors of the human space. But let's do it step by step so that, that we are all on the same page. So let me just uh, make sure that, 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 that um, yeah, uh, that we are all thinking about uh, the, the same problem. So let's assume that we have a quantum magnet, so a couple of spins, and we are thinking about a one-dimensional geometry. So it's a spin chain, and we think about the spin one chain. So there are three local states, and the local states I denote with minus, zero, and plus, according to the eigenvalues of the SZ operator. Okay, so minus one, zero, and plus one. So we are considering a system with charge and dipole conservation. So the charge co conservation corresponds to the conservation of the total magnetization. Okay, so this just a sum over all a set um, is uh, conserved. And the dipole uh, conservation is something like X times uh, the, um, uh, the spin operator or the charge density operator um, is conserved. Okay, so these two conservation laws we are considering and now, when we have this charge and, uh, and, and diaper conservation, we, we can see that this is, oops, this is severely restricting the motion of a system. So when, let's go back a step and just think about the system with charge conservation, right? This can be a state, I have, sorry, I have a second. The, uh, this can be a state, for instance, initial state, which I can, can consider is a state of a, a, a real product state of zeros and I have one plus somewhere in the middle and then zeros again. And then when I'm thinking about the quantum mechanical system with charge conservation, it would undergo a quantum random walk. 
And in the end, it will actually spread. I mean, okay, it depends on which setting you're, you're uh, considering. I mean, if you just think about the hopping problem on a one dimensional graph, a quantum mechanical hopping problem, then the solutions would be essentially Bessel functions, and we get sound poles uh, which are moving out, right? And they will get some Bessel function interference in the middle. Okay, so this would be like a symmetric spreading of this, of this charge. When I have dipole conservation on top of it, right, then this is not so easy anymore because a charge cannot hop to the right because even though charge is conserved, the dipole moment would not be, right, because dipole moment is x times s set x. So I would change my unit of dipole moment by one if I'm hopping essentially once to the right. But what I can do is I, I can hop once to the right and simultaneously emit a dipole to the left. Okay, this is an allowed process because you see uh, this conserves both charge and dipole moment of the system. But you already see that the number of configurations which I can reach is highly restricted due to these two conservation laws. And that was what we wanted to understand in the beginning of the project. Okay, good. So this was what we wanted to understand. So let me write down now concretely also a Hamiltonian which uh, conserves charge and dipole Hamiltonian. The simplest one which you can think about uh, is the following, that you just think about a, an upper, a Hamiltonian which consists of a sum of local terms. And the local terms is, is something like uh, S minus in the middle, it's minus squared in the middle and this plus um, to the left and to the right of it. You see, uh, this is automatically conserving the dipole moment because I, make, I always make simultaneous flips like this, right? So I remove, say from the left and the right, uh, two spins up and then, they, uh, and then they lower my central state by two. So this is a dipole conserving move, essentially. So the dipole moment is um, directly conserved for such Hamiltonians. And it turns out- is it can you achieve that with spin a half or no? ah yeah right then then we have to be a bit more careful because for spin a half i can't act as minus squared this is why i chose uh, spin one as this as the lowest smallest uh, manifold if i want to write it in that way but i can write a foresight operator for spin a half which looks like s plus s minus s minus s plus on four consecutive sides then i'm back in business again then I can write this down for a spin a half system. Does this make sense? So essentially uh, here, since I have S minus squared, I do require uh, at, least, uh, at least spin one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good, um, right. But then, you know, what we like to do when we looked at this uh, system is we wanted to do a numerical experiment. So we wanted to calculate the autocorrelation function of the charge, which is conserved, uh, um, uh, the total charge is conserved, but we want to look at the local autocorrelation function at infinite temperature. So infinite temperature just means to us so we are interested in properties of the whole spectrum, not just in the ground state, which may be very special, but the whole spectrum should be very generic actually. And this is what we, what we wanted to understand. And so we just thought, said, okay, we fix, uh, fix uh, the autocorrelation function to infinite temperature. And for any normal system, what you expect is that the autocorrelation function is decaying uh, to zero to its disconnected value essentially at, infin at infinitely late times. But for, for this Hamiltonian H3, it does not. The autocorrelation function gets stuck at a finite and large value at very late times. And when you increase system size, this stays perfectly robust. So we were very surprised about that because that looks as if the system is localized. In a localized system, the autocorrelation function would be finite at late times. Whereas in, in, a gothic, in an ergodic system, the relaxation would be described by hydrodynamics, actually. So it should relax down to zero at late times with a power law tail or something like this. But this does not here. So why is that? And that, that, that was kind of uh, the goal of this work here, uh, which I'm showing you the, on the bottom right. It turns out, when I now go a bit uh, uh, in, in the direction of, um, 
um, um, of, of, of the one which was asked before, if I'm now increasing uh, the range of my Hamiltonian to be a bit bigger, like now acting on four consecutive sides, but still within the spin one manifold, it turns out my correlations functions, functions do relax, even though they relax in a very slow manner. So this was also bustling fast. So this is what we wanted to understand why, what is going on in the system. And when you think about it very qualitatively, uh, just and, and on, on, on hydrodynamics grounds, then you might see that there is really something strange about the dipole conserving uh, Hamiltonian. And the strange thing is that when we write down, for instance, a continuity equation, okay, then we have something like the time derivative of the density is gradient of a current. And a current current correlation function is something which is related to the type or response, right? Because that's related to the conductivity. So if my type or moment is conserved, this might have very strong uh, constraints on how I think in a coarse grained way about the dynamics uh, of this system. Okay, good. And again, also what we can what we can look at is so one can look at yeah. Okay, so, so another incarnation of this fact that the system is not relaxing is that actually, when we look at these requirements from eigenstate hemorrhization hypothesis, which I was advocating before, none of the eigenstates actually of this Hamiltonian, oh, right, so just to make the nomenclature clear, so I'm calling this Hamiltonian H3 because it acts on three, con on three consecutive sides. N, N plus one, N, N plus two. H4 acts on four consecutive sides. Okay, so I call it H4. And, 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 and what I was showing you, the red curve was just the time evolution of H3. So this is very special. And H3 plus H4 is the blue curve. So it's just to set the, the nomenclature. And this H3 does not look thermal at all. So for instance, we can characterize how thermal a system is either by looking at this relaxation dynamics or by looking at the entanglement entropy of the system. And this is way below uh, the, 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 the maximum value of entanglement, which is the one which you would expect for thermalizing systems. So this is the so-called beige uh, constraint on the, on the entanglement entropy. And the red dots, they are all extremely far away from this beige constraint. So they are all highly non-thermal, okay? And this is what we wanted to understand. And this leads me to this notion of Hilbert space fragmentation. So before I go into Hilbert space fragmentation, just uh, let me emphasize again, when I have a spin a half, a, a set, a collection of spin a halves, say n spin a halves, then the Hilbert space has dimension two to the n. If I have on top of it charge conservation, then it is something like a binomial coefficient. Right, so uh, n divided by the number of spins, uh, n over uh, or n choose the number of spin ups. So this is already somehow um, fragmenting, if you want, the, the Hilbert space into different blocks, but there are not so many of them, right? So they are somehow polynomially many in the system size. Okay, so what we do here now is we look at one of those sectors which are defined by a fixed charge and by a fixed dipole moment and then look at the substructure of these of these blocks okay which for a conventional system would be a fully connected matrix but in our case and actually maybe i should have uh, Maybe I, I try to log in real quick with my iPad that I can also, or can I annotate here somehow? Uh, annotate. Maybe, um, so, uh, so when you think about um, the, the local Hilbert space structure for our system, then we have here three different states. So zero, uh, plus and minus, okay? Uh, and when I, when, I, when I take three of these uh, spin ones, uh, so another one and another one here, then it would, my Hilbert space would be uh, um, three to the third power, which is 27, right? So nine times three, yeah, this is right. So it's, uh, it's 20, sorry, my, my writing is not very nice because I'm writing on, on my mouse, but, but just for illustration. And then it turns out when you look at the Hamiltonian, right, it has such, it is of the form like S plus, oops, 
as minus as minus squared, and then as plus, and the emission conjugate, of course. But then you see that many out of these twenty-seven configurations will be directly annihilated by the by the Hamiltonian. For instance, something like plus plus minus would be annihilated because I can't act with an S plus here and the Hermitian conjugate of it would also annihilate it because I can't act with an S minus here anymore, right? I have already hit, hidden, yeah, I, hit, I hit already the wall essentially of my local Hilbert space. And it turns out when you do the counting and write down all the configurations that 19 out of these 27 configurations are actually directly annihilated by the Hamiltonian. This already tells you also that there is, I mean, strong constraints, that there will be strong constraints going on. And so we can now build so-called frozen states where the Hamil action of the Hamiltonian really leads nothing. I mean, it can't, it can't act on these states. We can estimate that. I don't know, I mean, this is, I don't know how familiar this is. I mean, in classical statistical uh, physics, we have this Bowling estimate for the entropy of uh, an ice configuration. And Bowling has uh, given us a way of uh, estimating the number of frozen configurations. And we can apply this estimate, the Bowling estimate, in a similar way to our, our system too. So what we do is our one-dimensional chain, we make an accordion out of it, so we squeeze it together and the Hamiltonian then either acts on the pink or on the blue triangles, right? Either on that one or on that one, the three consecutive sides always. And each triangle has then, then 19 out of 27 configurations are frozen in the Hilbert space. So uh, we have N minus two triangles in the system. N is the number of spins. And then the total uh, number of states would be three to the n. And it's reduced by this frozen factor, essentially. This is how you, how you apply this Bowling estimate. And this is what we can do to, to our system, right? And from that, we get out that, that essentially this is the number of frozen states for our, uh, for our um, uh, dipole conserving Hamiltonian, just H3 that is now. So I'm focusing on H3 now. And it turns out, that the blue curve would be, so this is now as a function of system size, the number of frozen states, which are states with a Hilbert space sector, which just has dimension one, because you know the Hamiltonian, when you act on it, doesn't give anything. Uh, uh, it can't connect to a new Fox state. Mm -hmm. So it's a Hilbert space sector of dimension one, and the Bowling estimate would grow exponentially uh, the number of frozen state would go exponentially with system size n, and the exact value, uh, well, is a little bit larger than our Bowling estimate, but it's, it's pretty close to what I'm presenting to you here. But you see from that already that there are exponentially many frozen states in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, of, of, of the full Hilbert space. Okay. So that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that, um, that doesn't mean that, that those are important, right? The question is what happens with the rest, which is the rest of the states, which is still much bigger because the full Hilbert space, how it grows is this three to the L or three to the N is this red curve. And there's a, a lot of space <laughs> between, between the, the green dots and the, and, and, the, and the red and the red curve essentially. And we want to understand now what happens. Uh, are there other sectors which are still much, much smaller than the full Hilbert space? And the answer is yes, because what I can immediately do is I can construct Hilbert space sectors, which are again, completely disconnected from the rest of the world uh, of dimension two. I can build new two level systems in a, in, in, in a background, okay? By again, choosing some of these configurations, details don't matter so much. But the point is in the end, I can now numerically just ask what is the size uh, when I have a, a, I can now ask for a fixed uh, charge and for a six, fixed dipole moment, how many subsectors do I have in my Hilbert space? Okay, somehow constructed from the rules which I was just giving, giving you uh, vaguely, vaguely speaking uh, before. So I can now ask, for instance, uh, Hilbert space sectors of dimension one, those would be this Bowling estimate uh, Hilbert frozen sectors. They grow exponentially with system size. So this is red, this nine spins, uh, 
blue is 11 spin, 13, uh, and uh, green is 13 spins. So this would be this bowling estimate. Then I have <coughs> Hilbert spaces of dimension two, Hilbert space of dimension three, four, five, and it goes up to 10 to the three. But the point is two, uh, three to the 13, the full size of the Hilbert space is much, much, much larger than 10 to the three. And I get here exponentially many fragmented uh, subsectors in this Hilbert space. Any questions on that? Yeah, this is always the <laughs> bit awkward thing about Zoom talks that the feedback is kind of, uh, is always minimal uh, what one has to work with. So, I don't know if there are questions, please interrupt me. Very happy uh, to take them. Well, maybe maybe I have a little question. There. So the the Hamilton is remission, right? Yes, yes, yes. So I'm thinking so, about it. So the Hilbert space <clears throat> breaks up into orthogonal direct sum of invariant subspaces, <clears throat> right? And you're saying that there's a very big sector with zero eigenvalue. There's a very Big, big set. Now there, there are no big sectors. So essentially, when we think about the the when you think about the Hamiltonian as a matrix, okay. So then, uh, then I can fix the dipole moment and the and the and the charge uh, and the charge Q and P shall be fixed. And normal for normal systems, my Hamiltonian now would be a connected matrix in this space, okay. But it turns out for our case. We get many uh, dimension one subsectors, 10 to the four, 10 to the five dimension one subsectors, many dimension two subsectors, which are two by two matrices, many dimension three, and so on. And there will, there will be a bit bigger ones, but all very, very small compared to the full dimension of this, of this, of this uh, subsector. So this is what this graph, which looks very complicated, uh, actually tells us. So that our Hilbert space is fragmenting into many, many individual substructures. And what our so ultimate so goal we talking be, about, you know, twenty-seven and whatever nineteen. Uh, weren't you saying that you have a lot of null uh, nulls? Null. I mean, uh, vec, uh, vec these are those right, island, the, the null spaces where the where the Hamiltonian acting on the state uh, that gives just zero, right? Right. This is this is what you say. So this what what it means is that this uh, what how we call it is this is a so-called frozen state. So this will be this dimension one uh, Hilbert spaces, which are null eigenstates. Which are not, 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 uh, right. So this is even a bit special. You're right. Mm -hmm. Right. And those are there are many of those. And this is what you were referring to. So there are expon there are exponentially many uh, of the, of those one-dimensional states, if you want. Which are completely disconnected from the rest. But then I can play the game with two dimensional sectors. And then there are also exponentially many of those three dimensional ones, where three Fox states are connected. There are also exponentially many of those, if you want, right? And, and so on. So the Hilbert space is really fragmented like glass when you <laughs> toss it down on the ground in many, many, many different pieces, disconnected pieces due to this charge. I, 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 I guess I don't have the intuition, but. I mean, when you have a Hermitian, it's a Hermitian operator. Yes. Uh, we know we all know there's a spectral decomposition, so you can just choose yes. a basis of eigenstates. So yes. why aren't you just saying that it's all fragmented into one-dimensional sectors of eigenstates? Ah, okay. Because ah, okay, yeah, yeah. This is uh, of course uh, a good point. I can always find a unitary transformation which makes the system diagonal, right? But this is highly non-local, <clears throat> and here I'm thinking really in terms of uh, in terms of, 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 of connections of Fox states by local terms of the Hamiltonian. This is the difference. You see this locality of the transformation. This is, this is very important. So I'm not allowed to kind of diagonalize my, my matrix and say uh, these are all uh, dimension one subsectors because the unitary transformation is kind of, you know, when I apply the unitary transformation back, then the system is fully connected again. And here, all my unitary transformations, they are, they are essentially 
uh, uh, they have the substructure of the blocks, they're independent on the substructures. Does this make sense? So really I can't find any, any transformation which I apply to the system. I mean, it does not connect any, it does not connect the subsectors, essentially. That's the difference. So it's, I'm not allowed to, so, okay, uh, I'm not allowed to think about constructing highly non-local superposition of, uh, of coefficients to diagonalize the Hamiltonian. So I'm really thinking about um, the structure of the Hamiltonian uh, in terms of, yeah, in terms of this. Um, So this is, I don't know, I mean, this is a very important point. So I mean, if, 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 uh, if I can somewhat, I mean, make this uh, clearer, I mean, I'm certainly very, very happy uh, to try my best to, to do this. I mean, because that, that is really extremely crucial at the oh. point that you were raising. Mm -hmm. So, so are, are you saying that all the blocks are essentially contiguous, like in their support on the, on the sites where they act? When you say they're all like local and and you're only ah, no, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. So, okay, so these, um, so these sectors, I will give you examples of further examples of these sectors uh, later on. So the sectors themselves, I can diagonalize with a unitary transformation and then they become uh, diagonal, okay? And so I think my previous question uh, was now, okay, I can always find the unitary transformation to diagonalize a Hermitian uh, matrix. And so it, it will be, if, if you want, it will be always like dimension one uh, disconnected sectors. But this is a non-local non transformation in these box states, essentially with the diagonalization procedure. And um, what, I want to, what I want to ask is given in some Fox space uh, representation, what is the connectivity of my, of my matrix? And then it turns out if, before I do diagonalization, if you want, that my matrix is really consisting of individual, of individual sub, substructures. So they are emergent new conservation laws, which are splitting up my, my Hamiltonian into these small bits and pieces. So if you want, if I have charge conservation, my three to the L, three to the L, or three to the N, three to the N Hilbert space is split up in, in, into some subblocks already, right? And due to the conservation law of charge, those subblocks are not mixed. I can now diagonalize them individually if I want, but uh, they, these are all not mixed. So my eigenstates are only acting in this part. These eigenstates of those are only acting in that part, and the others, I mean, are, are um, uh, I can set to zero. And these, I can, all, uh, can always diagonalize the submatrices, right? And so, and what I am saying is that when I'm looking now at one of those blocks where I have charge and diaper conserved, then again, I get this substructure of matrices, which are not connected by the action of the Hamilton. Okay. Because when I'm starting out with an eigenstate, when I act the Hamiltonian uh, on it, then of course, I mean, it stays, uh, it stays in an eigenstate, but there's this unitary transformation, right, which, which I use to diagonalize essentially this, uh, the matrix, which I, which, I, which I don't want. I really want to think about Fox based configuration, non eigenstates, which are then, uh, and I want to ask how, uh, how do I build up this, 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 um, uh, this, this, this matrix structure of my Hamiltonian. Okay. Maybe I give you another. The idea that uh, the eigenstates are generally not localized and you want to look at localized states. Yes, yeah, localized. Okay, I mean, I, I really want to think about it. I mean, if, if I just may intervene, because I think it's relevant to the answer. Uh, so there's a way to characterize um, this property, which is basis independent. And I think you showed it with the entanglement entropy, right? I mean, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian have mm -hmm. the subthermal entropy and so and that's a basis independent statement so so the yeah, eigenstates so of the hamiltonian are not what you expect an energetic hamiltonian and so then you can phrase it differently but that's one example of basis independent characterization of what you're saying i think Right, right, because when you when you uh, look at the eigenstates of the system uh, then here um, one would expect for thermalizing System to really exhaust this page value essentially, right? And this is really saying that this this would be a basis independent measure. But what I really want to uh, say is, is really uh, simple minded in some sense that when I'm thinking about uh, let's say 
a Fox-based configuration of spins, that spin up, down, blah, blah, blah. So when I act with my Hamiltonian on it, how many other states can I reach by acting my Hamiltonian on it, right? And this defines me this, this subblock structure, essentially. And let me give you another concrete example to just tell you a bit more formally uh, the properties of a more non-trivial block compared to those frozen states. It turns out that the largest sector of this Hamiltonian H3 indeed maps onto a spin a half xy model, okay? So the, uh, the, um, the H3 operates on the spin one Hilbert space, so it has dimension three to the n. A spin a half xy model would have dimension two to the n, right? Uh, so this is much, much, much smaller <laughs> than three to the n. And so how does this mapping work? So I have these configurations of zero plus uh, zero, zero minus. And remember, so plus means Fox state uh, in the basis of an S set operator. So plus is eigenvalue plus one, zero is eigenvalue zero, minus is eigenvalue minus one. And then what, what I do is I, I, I make a mapping based on yeah, electromagnetism, if you want. So I essentially um, let field lines em emanating from a plus charge to a minus charge. So these are these lines going into the right direction from plus to minus. Oh, sorry, I was telling you, what am I doing? <laughs> uh, sorry. And, and, and here again, from plus uh, to minus, it, uh, the, the field lines are going, okay? And then when the action of my Hamiltonian in this new space, what it really amounts to is flipping spins. So it's an XY model in the new space uh, which is just flipping of spins. And instead of, you know, normally we draw the XY model in Z eigenbasis, here would be the XY model in, in X eigenbasis, if you want. Okay. And now we see the, ed, the spins at the edge, they are fixed by the charges at the edge, uh, but I still have N minus one free spins. Uh, and there's a degeneracy because I can choose the edge charges either to be plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, or minus, minus. Okay. But the point is, when I calculate the ratio of two to the n divided by three to the n, then this is a vanishingly small fraction in the thermodynamically limit, right? And this is the biggest sector. So the biggest sector in my Hilbert space is vanishingly small. And this is what we call so-called strong fragmentation of my Hilbert space. So the Hilbert space is really fragmenting, it's splitting up into many, many, many sectors and none of them is big. And this is another statement also, which, which, which you can see from the entanglement entropy, if you're more uh, used to think about these type of quantities, that the page value is not saturated for any eigenstate of the system, right? This is essentially the same statement. On the other hand, I have shown to you the autocorrelation function for this H3 plus H4, which looked differently. It did not uh, stay at a constant, but it relaxed. And it turns out we can still find exponentially many frozen states uh, for, this, for this system. We can construct, we can use a more extended Pauli, Pauling uh, estimate for the, for, this, for the number of frozen states. It's easy to construct them. It's done in this paper in details. But it turns out the largest connected sector of this H3 plus H4 carries almost all states. So this is what we draw now. So this is now the dimension, the Hilbert space dimension of the largest sector divided by the Hilbert space sector of the block with conserved charge and conserved dipole moment. And the conserved charge and dipole moment is Q equals zero, P equals zero in that case. For H3, the largest sector is exponentially decaying with system size. This means strong fragmentation. So in the thermodynamic limit, the largest sector is vanishingly small. Whereas for H3 plus H4, fragmentation is weaker and uh, in the largest sector attains a constant fraction as a function of system size. Okay, so it's the, the largest sector is constant as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a as a function of the system size. And this means that the typical state will lie in this largest sector. And when I take an infinite temperature average, it will just relax because it's compatible with with, with, with page value, uh, with, with, for instance, page saturation of the entanglement entropy. And this is what we call weak fragmentation. So we have these two classes of fragmentation, if you want, okay? So uh, and we, do we, I understand we, correctly, when you say that the spin a half occupies a negligible part of the sector, uh, of the 
yes. complete space. So you're you're thinking of a system of spins which are a mixture of spin of a half and spin one. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. This is this was about this mapping, right? So I can now. Um, the point is, I can now map the dynamic. So given the charge and diaper conservation, I can write down a particular initial state. For instance, this one, and I can now ask which kind of dynamics is generated by my Hamiltonian. When I act my Hamiltonian on that state, which new Fox states are generated? Okay, then each time I act my Hamiltonian on it, many new states can be generated in general. And it turns out I can describe this action by an effective XY model on a spin a half degree of freedom. And so this determines me the largest, uh, the largest connected matrix essentially of the superblocks. I guess I didn't understand when you were comparing two to the n with three to the n. Yes. I mean, uh, so I, that the Hilbert space, it's a finite Hilbert space, two to the n and three to the n. But uh, how are you comparing one with the other? I, I, I don't quite understand what the Hilbert space is. Whether okay, it's so we have to go other. back again then to, uh, to, to understand this a bit in more detail. So let me annotate here again. So we, we I, I try to draw again my block picture, right? So we have now fixed Q uh, to zero and P to zero. Charge and diaper moment is fixed to zero. So these are the trivial conserved quantities because I impose them from the get go on my Hamiltonian. And now I said I have these many small subsectors of dimension one. These are these frozen states, which we were just talking about before. Then there may be dimension two subsectors and so on. And there will be one which is the largest sector. Okay. And the question now is does this largest sector scale as three to the n? Which still can be, no, because we can have exponentially many subsectors, but the largest sector still scaling as 0.9 times 3 to the n or something like this. This is one scenario. Or another scenario is that the largest sector scales in a vanishingly, in a much, much, much uh, smaller way than the, than the full growth of the Hilbert space. And this is what I have shown you this largest sector can be mapped onto an XY model of an effective spin a half degree of freedom. This, this connected subsector here, okay? If this is a subpart of my, of my whole Hamiltonian, if you want, of my whole Hilbert space. So. so you're projecting the spin one Hilbert space onto a spin two Hilbert space? Of I a mean, spin, spin a half. Hilbert. I'm not projecting it. It comes out really of the fact that I'm uh, choosing a certain configuration and of the fact that I have charge and diaper conservation. I don't have the ability to go from this state, may maybe if I want to start with, from that set, I can't go out into another, into another sector. This is forbidden by the fact that I have charge and diaper conservation. And this is what I, what I want to convey somehow that this charge and diaper conservation, this doesn't allow me to go everywhere. <laughs> and it restricts me tremendously where I am allowed to go. And, and, and in particular, the largest sector really grows two to the n. Maybe let me give me give you give you a little bit more of mathematical rigor on this statement because what I want to ask is the next question. drawings. So what I what I um, the question which I wanted to ask is now when we think about this Hamiltonian with strong fragmentation, can we label all the sectors with new emergent quantum numbers? It has, I mean, it has to be like that, right? That we have new quantum numbers because we can, uh, we can, my, my Hamiltonian becomes block diagonal, but can we identify them? This is the question. And this is what we could, and this is this statistically localized integral of motion. So I, I don't know, I mean, I'm already pretty late, I think, right, in terms of time. So do I maybe have five more minutes to? Yeah, yeah of course, because we had a uh, late start and many questions. Yeah, no, that's good, but we, we don't need to kind of um, stretch it. No, no, please continue. Still, I mean, this helps maybe to understand the gist of these, of these ideas. So what I can define now is <clears throat> such a so-called SLEOM, statistically localized integral of motion, which is an operator Q, which is a sum over some local terms and the Q operator is conserved and these local terms 
Yeah, these local terms, they are, when you take an expectation value of an arbitrary state on this Hilbert space, this, uh, uh, this, this density, the density associated with this operator, uh, this is localized in space. So the variance in I divided by the system size L has to vanish as the system size goes to infinity. Okay, this is this uh, statistically localized integrals of motion. And now, before we go into the complicated case of the diaper conserving Hamiltonian, let me give you a very simple toy model where these statistically localized integrals of motion should, uh, I think, are a bit clearer. And this is the so called um, DJ model, DJC model. So the idea is that I have now again a local Hilbert space of three states minus zero and plus. The minuses can hop around, the pluses can hop around, but minuses and pluses can, can't exchange position. They cannot exchange the position, okay? So the pattern of the plus and minuses is conserved. This is the rules which I want to apply. And now it turns out that the spin of the kth particle from the left is actually a conserved quantity because they can't exchange their patterns, right? If I have a minus and a plus here, then the second particle will always remain a plus. And this is my 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 conserved my slion, like my uh, my statistically localized integral of motion. And the local operators they are essentially pro they are essentially just the set operators. So here this would be give me back the expect the uh, the eigenvalue plus one. And the P are string-like projection operators, which are counting how many particles are to the left of this. And if I ask about my second particle, then there has to be one particle to the left of it. If I'm asking about my third particle, then there have to be two particles to the left of it. And this is what this string-like projection operator is taking care of, okay? So when I'm now asking about the distribution of these of these operators, I want to ask, is this really localized in space, right? Because this, this would be my definition of a Sleon, the second part of the definition, of the first part of the definition now, this is conserved. But what is about the second part of my definition? And in order to evaluate that, what I can do is I can take a, 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 a hard random uh, expectation value of this operator density, O dagger O, if you want. And we can evaluate that. This is easy to evaluate for this DJ model. It's a binomial uh, distribution, essentially. The binomial distribution, what I'm asking here with this projection is what uh, um, I'm, I'm asking, I want to calculate the projector onto configurations on which side I is occupied on which side I is occupied and where I have K to the min K minus one fermions to the left, okay? So I say, for instance, is this side occupied and do I have two fermions to the left, right? What is the probability for that? Or is this side occupied and I have two, uh, um, uh, two fermions to the, to the left, okay? So in that sense, I has to be larger than K, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. A typical uh, value of this uh, of this high random distribution looks like this, and this is a this is a binomial, and uh, it starts off at ten. I chose k k ten, and then okay, it goes like this hmm, as a function of i. It is peaked around a, a, a mean position, which is k divided by okay, nu is the the density. So when I take a high random state, I can have two charges. And one state, the zero is no charge. So the, the average filling is two thirds, right? Two out of three local Hilbert space states give me a charge. So nu is two thirds, fixed to two thirds. So here, and this is what we, we see the average position, then k is 10, is then at 15, hmm? as you can see from this binomial distribution. From the binomial, we also get that the standard deviation in the bulk, so if k is somewhat proportional to the system size, then the standard deviation is square root of k, so it's square root of l. And that means that when I'm looking at the relative width, so the standard deviation divided by l, it decreases with, with system size. So it's a localized, it's a local, it's a, it's a statistically localized integral of motion. The operator itself 
is a string like operator, it's not localized at all, but once they take expectation values, they become localized in space. Okay, so this is important uh, for us because we can, it looks like this a little bit. So in the middle, we get binomial distributions. At the corner, we get some exponentially localized uh, properties just from the tail of the binomial distribution function. And when we do this rescaling with square root L, then we get essentially yeah, scaling collapse. And from that, we can understand <clears throat> also that, yeah, that, 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 yeah, okay, but this is not so important here. Let, let's just skip over this. But this is the point of this Leon. And the point is also we can define the statistically localized integrals of motion also for the uh, dipole conserving, uh, dipole conserving H3 Hamiltonian by again doing this mapping, which I was advocating before, that I let electric field lines go from a plus to a minus charge. This has this been a half degrees going to the left and from plus to minus, and from plus to minus and so on. And it turns out using this new perspective of these statistically localized integrals of motion, we can write down the full set of conservation laws of this H3 Hamiltonian. It's not just charge and dipole moment, and the left and the rightmost charge, which we have kind of seen already in the previous considerations. But it's also the number, okay. Oh, sorry. I, have to, I have to go a step back. I thought that I could <laughs> explain this a bit uh, faster, but this doesn't work. So, you know, I want to unambiguously label, and this maybe also goes back to your question, right? I mean, how the heck can I label with a spin a half degree of freedom in my Hilbert space, right? It can't work because my three to the n Hilbert space is much bigger than my two to the n Hilbert space. And the reason why this works is because I was not telling you the full story yet. I can make this mapping of field lines going from plus to minus, plus to minus, but what do I do if I have a two minuses in a row, right? If I have two minuses in a row, instead of always this plus minus plus minus configurations, then if I just draw the field lines going from plus to, uh, to minus, right, then I, will have a, uh, then I will have a defect here. I might be able to, I can draw it through the minus defect, but then I cannot unambiguously define my mapping, right? So I, I, uh, I, I need to introduce defects essentially in addition. So the defect is every, when, when they are, whenever there are consecutive charges, the position of the duplicate charge is essentially a defect. And with that new degree of freedom, I have now the opportunity to label really all my three to the end states. And this maybe may, may uh, resolve your confusion from before, right? Or this, this I mean, I, maybe I didn't present it very clearly, but now I have again, the three degrees of freedom per side, which is spin pointing to the left, spin pointing to the right on the bond, Defect there or defect not there to the right of the of the of the uh, of the bond. And for instance, if I have now four consecutive pluses, I get three consecutive defects. And so the point is, these defects they are my statistically localized integrals of motion, and the number and charge of defects is conserved in the system. In addition, with the dipole moment in between the defects, and with all those labels, I can label my whole my whole Hilbert space. Okay, and that's that's kind of the the essence uh, here, which I which I wanted to advocate that this charge and dipole conservation is very non-trivial. It can lead to these very exciting uh, substructures in the Hilbert space. We can find rigorously, we can label rigor rigorously all the uh, subsectors of the Hilbert space and, and find all the conservation laws, which are very non-local in the which are. Uh, not very not which, which is somewhat non-local uh, in the nature and so a little bit non-trivial to see okay so you can also think about hydrodynamics in these systems is now more to an outlook this work or yeah, some transport and gauge theory so these are all related so constrained quantum dynamics can give rise uh, can give rise to really a wealth of of exotic phenomena and this is what we are researching at the moment and here again special thanks to Pablo and Dibor uh, who, who pushed forward these two uh, these two kind of projects which I was presenting uh, to you today and yeah I also thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoyed this perspective in Hilbert space fragmentation <laughs> thanks 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 Michael uh, 
you see we retain a large fraction of the initial Hilbert space we started with. So it's a sign that the talk was uh, was interesting. Um, <laughs> So I'm very happy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We're all connected. Uh, we had quite a few questions, and it is late for you, but let me uh, ask the audience if we have any other questions, maybe the students. Uh, so I see uh, Geoffroy Bergeron who raised a hand. So, Geoffroy, mm -hmm. you know, please, please uh, yeah. ask um, a question. Yes, yeah, so how do you uh, rule out uh, that it's not just a finite size effect? I mean, do, do you have some? ideas to tell you that or, or you, it's just simulation that you run with bigger and bigger systems right so our initial intuition we gained from numerical simulations but then since we were able to build this uh, statistically localized integers of motion so the, the part of the talk where i was really rushing <laughs> tremendously through uh, so so since we were since we were uh, able to build analytically the statistically localized integrals of motion, we are really able to label uh, all Hilbert space sectors and we can construct them analytically in some sense, the sizes of them, even in the thermodynamic limit. And uh, this, from that we know, for instance, that there is, indeed has to be this strong fragmentation because we do know that the largest Hilbert space sector grows as two to the n and they can take n to a billion and it still will grow two to the n instead of three to the n. This really allowed us to gain a lot of more insights uh, than the small scale numerics. Nonetheless, I also wanted to show you the small scale numerics because it gives you, I think, some intuition about what is going on in the system. So more than this mathematical background, if you want. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> so maybe if we have one last question from, from the audience. Um, oh, that's discouraging, you know, right? So you say, <laughs> limiting to, limiting to. <laughs> no, I mean, I encourage one last question. <laughs> Just because it is late for you. I mean, we will have to let you go eventually. Um, so anyone, because I, can ask a question if I'm forced to. <laughs> um, okay, let me go. I have you know an hour worth of questions, but let me just ask one. So, for the H3 Hamiltonian, you identified a finite number of conserved quantities, right? And this number does not grow with the system size. I mean, if you just showed a previous or next to no, no, actually there are uh, there are uh, many many conserved quantities it's charge dipole left and right most charge these are all countable but then the number and uh, uh, and charge of defects right now have many options in placing in okay you can place one to l uh, defects but i mean the operator that gives you the number of defects and the charge of defects that's one operator for the number of defects. Is that correct? That, that, that absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it can take many values, I agree, but there, there's one operator. So you, yes, yes, yes. When I say one quantity, I mean operator that commutes with a Hamiltonian. Right. Mm -hmm. And this Leom's, the sum of the, is, uh, right, the, mm -hmm. the sum of the, the defects is conserved. This is just this one operator. This is true. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the number of conserved operators doesn't grow with system size. The number of eigenvalues of each conserved That's quantity. Right. So, um, but it's not as if it's like not quite. It's, it's interesting, right? Yeah. So it, the answer is yes and no in some sense because mm -hmm. the okay operators. It's a bit like of a definitional question in some sense because when you how do you think about this in a proper way? So when you when you say one operator which is conserved is the dipole moment between defects. So when I'm assuming a finite defect density, for instance, then I have an indeterminate dynamic limit extensively many dipole moments between the defects which are conserved, right? And I would associate with them, each of them, an individual operator in some sense. Even though, I mean, the notion of it is somehow, somehow like, it's P1 is the dipole moment in this first interval between the first defect to the, to the second one. P2 is the dipole moment between the Second, uh, second defect to the to the third and so on, right? But there are, for a finite defect density, there are extensively many uh, of those of those operators. On the other hand, 
Okay, so those conserved quantities are dis they're distinct from the charge, right? The charge you just write down sum of a z. There's right, but also only the one statistically operator. localized integrals of motion. So mm -hmm. those also, I mean, when I have a finite defect density, I have an extensive number of conserved quantities again, which are the Q alphas. Q alpha tells me this operator, I can label this as a QK, but the subindex K can carry extensively many uh, values. For any, for, so I think I would call this then, in that spirit, I would call it extensively many conserved quantities. So it's, it's growing in general with, with the system size. Polynomially with, uh, with the system size. The number of... Yes, 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 yes. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. oh, this is what you yeah. meant, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, okay, no. Because now you have the subscript K and in the next slide, you would just call that as one class of conserved quantities, yes, yes. but it really hides the fact that you can define you know, many conserved quantities for that name, you know, yes. number of defects. Okay. Based on that labeling, we can understand all the fact that the system is relaxing to a finite value and the autocorrelation functions and so on and so forth. So this all automatically pops out of this formalism of the statistically localized integrals of motion, essentially. Yeah. Okay, now this clarifies uh, my confusion. Yeah, thanks. So on this note, we had plenty of time to discuss and it was a very beautiful talk, Michael. Thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure to hear it. Thanks for having me. And uh, thank you for speaking today and I uh, wish you and everyone uh, a nice evening. So Michael, I'll book you for uh, an hour of questions. <laughs> it sounds good, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if anyone is interested to talk, please just drop me an email and I'm happy to. Uh, to, uh, to. Shotgun, I'm, not I'm the first anymore, one. But the other day. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye. All right. Bye, Michael. Thanks.